Hi, my name is Bogdan Dobrika and I'm an Associated Lecturer of the Faculty of Physics, University of Bucharest. And during this online session, I will try to guide you on how to use Python for static simulation of various power systems. Um, a little bit about my background. So um, uh, my background is in, in uh, mathematics and computer science. Uh, and I also have a PhD in physics, um, but all these are related because my, my field of interest is simulation and modeling. Um, so um, usually my lectures are filled with uh, differential equation and how we can use them to model different things. But in this session, I will try to, to uh, limit the number of equations that you will see and the, the um, mathematics requirements so uh, uh, so that it, it will be accessible for all of you. Yeah, so sorry for, for uh, my uh, mistakes or, or my interruptions. Usually I'm not used to, to give this kind of talks in front of a computer. Even if I do it over Zoom or Teams, I expect some kind of interactivity and right, right now we don't have it. Um, in my background, you can see the University of Bucharest main building. And in this corner, exactly in this corner, was the Faculty of Mathematics and Computer Science that I, I finished. The, the Faculty of Physics is not part of this building. Uh, it has a different location. Um, situation, it's situated actually near the edge of the city where we had uh, uh, in the past a nuclear reactor. Okay, so I think we can start. Let me share my screen. Uh, open the screen. So um, again, I will have to apologize for this kind of presentation. It doesn't have so many pictures, but it allows me to scribble over it. So you and you will get these notes, you will get them together with my handwriting. Um, you also find here my email address. This is my personal email address. So if you have questions about anything that we are discussing here, or you have some ideas, just don't hesitate to drop me an email and I'll try to answer you as soon as possible. Um, okay, so um, why do we need this power system simulation? As you notice, we, we are kind of dependent of, of uh, energy. So everything around us, functions with energy. This uh, computer that I'm using, the tablet that I'm writing to, uh, when it's warm outside, we need air conditioning. And when it's cold, we need uh, central heating. So we, we are dependent on this energy. So how we are producing, delivering, and consuming power is kind of important. And that's why we need this simulation of uh, power systems. Why we use Python for this? Python, we have a lot of tools that are specifically designed for analyzing this kind of large equation systems. And um, it, it allows you to, to hide the complexity behind some very simple and natural commands. Mostly the equations that are behind the uh, power system simulations are nonlinear ones. So let's move on and discuss a little bit about the Python tools that we, we will use. I, th I think the most important one is the NumPy library. So what is this library about? If you're familiar with MATLAB, this is kind of the equivalent of MATLAB in Python. Uh, it allows us to do a lot of complex calculations using matrices, and it has a lot of natural things that are implemented in, in it. So if we have a matrix, let's say like this, which is multiplied with another matrix like this, as you can see, normal matrix multiplication, we, we cannot do this because we, uh, for example, this has the size two, one. So two rows, one column, and this has the size two, two. And when we are multiplying matrices, these two, the column number of the first one needs to match the row number of the second one. So what, what do you think the nature of way of multiplying this is? It's multiplying each of the first row values of the second matrix with, with the first row value of the first matrix. So the result can be like this, AC, AD, BE, BF. And the, the cool thing is that this NumPy already assumes this natural kind of transformation. So yeah, uh, for example, if, you, if those two dimensions will match, it will multiply them as matrices. 
Uh, and if they don't match, they, they will try to do this kind of operation, which is called bro broadcasting. Sorry for my handwriting, it's not the best one. The next tool that we are using is Pandas, uh, which, which is a library based on the, the first one. So if with NumPy, we can operate with matrices, with Pandas, we can operate with something which uh, th that is called data frames. And this data frame is the equivalent in Python of an Excel file. So whenever I have a, a table in Excel, I can very easily import it to Pandas. And I will show you how you can do this. Uh, then our next tool, which is Again, a very useful tool, especially for the ones that don't have so much programming experience, is Jupyter Notebook. So this Jupyter Notebook, it's actually an IDE. And uh, in this integrated development environment, you can do your Python experiments. So for example, one, one of the cool things that you can do here in a Jupyter Notebook is that you can test pieces of code. And even if they fail, they, they will not affect the uh, entire program. Next. For this specific uh, purpose of simulating uh, the power systems, we will use the PyPSA uh, library, which actually Python for power system analysis. Th this is what it's called. Um, I, I gave you the links so you can read a little bit more about the, the documentation of how the library is implemented in Python. The last, which I'm, I'm trying to show you today is the PyPSA EUR. PyPSA comes from the PyPSA from before, and EUR is actually from Europe, which is a list of already predefined models co covering the European network of transmission system operators. You will have their models for generators, for transmission lines, for transformers, uh, but only at the large scale of Europe, so only for important nodes. The first step that you need to do is to install the required software. You can download it from here and install it from here, or you can do this from, uh, from the store, Windows Store, if you have a Windows computer. But uh, for example, I, I'm pretty sure that it comes pre-installed on uh, OS X and Linux uh, computers. This version, I think this is the important part. It's not specifically required. So you can use whatever version you have uh, at, if it's at least three. So the next thing, if you already installed Python, I, I will try to show you how to get it from the uh, store. So I will open the start menu on the store and you can search here for Python. And as you can see, you have it here and regularly available to, to be installed. Just click on it, press get to install it. I will need to do this because I have a, I have it already installed. So the next step is to install the required soft the, the required modules from Python because Python is is just a general language. We actually need some specific um, options from some specific modules from from it. So the first command I put here the three commands that you should run. I, I will run run them with you. So the first command will be this one, Python minus M pip install minus U. So when I run this, uh, it will tell Python to run this uh, module pip and upgrade the same module pip. Uh, why I'm using it like this is it's because I, I want to be sure that it, it runs this module with this version of Python that I have here. Actually on the same system, you can have different versions of Python. So when you're having these kind of versions, it's better to specify exactly which uh, module to, which version of Python to use to install the modules for. Pip from here is the Python uh, package manager. So it's actually like a store for packages for Python. It allows you to install different modules without knowing from where it gets them. Uh, so it's pre pretty easy. Um, so the list of modules that I want to install is this. Uh, and I'm writing this one. As you will see, uh, I don't have to install anything because my, my requirements are already satisfied. Uh, but for you, you probably will, uh, yeah, it will take some time and you will get some download messages and everything like this. 
Okay, so I will close the console because the, the last command from here is the one that it's actually running Jupyter Notebook. Uh, more specifically, you need to go to, to a folder where you want to do all your development. So for example, I have a development folder here uh, and I have work, Python and a PyPSA folder. And I want to run Jupyter Notebook inside this folder. Why? Because I don't want it to access other folders that it finds in his path. So in order to start the Jupyter Notebook in this folder, it's pretty easy. I will just write CMD here up in the Windows Explorer. And you can see that it already started this CMD into the specific folder that I put it in. And right here, I will run the Jupyter. Uh, so so this, this is the Jupyter Notebook. This is, what does it do? Actually, right now from the start, it doesn't do anything. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is to create a new notebook. So I will just write here, notebook. I will use the Python 3 notebook. And it will open a new tab in the browser. As you, as you can see, you don't need to have anything installed. It's already using your browser for this. And you have these kind of cells. And I will explain a little bit how these cells are working because we will use Jupyter Notebook quite a lot during this presentation. So th there are two types of cells. Um, these ones that uh, have this in in front of it. And I will explain a little bit later what, what it means. Um, th these are called code cells. So wh why? Because I can write Python commands. Um, I'm assuming that you already know a little bit of Python, just, just a little bit. You don't need to know too much. Uh, for example, um, I'm pretty sure that you know how to assign a variable. So for example, I would put a equal to, and let's say b equal a string of characters. Uh, so, so right now the, this code wasn't run, but for example, if I click this button here, run, the cell is run and I get this one inside the square brackets. This, this allows me to see the order in which I run the cells. As you can see, it already, when, when I run this cell, it already created a new cell be, uh, just below this one. So right now in this cell, I, I can either put the name of the variable and click run. I'm, I'm usually too lazy to click run and I'm usually using the keyboard. So the shortcut is shift enter. So when I press shift enter, you can see that it found the value of A from here and printed the result. I have an out this time, not only an in. Um, and um, for, for example, I will show you why this order is important. Uh, so let's say I will put here A equal four and I will run again this cell from here. And when I run, the cell between them, the value of A will be still two. Why? Because this number here, it's actually the closest one to the cell that I just run. So it will take the values that were defined just before this cell was run. So for example, if I, I can have this kind of cell, let's, let, let's put a C equal five here. And if I run this, cell like this C, I will get an error. Why? Because the C is not defined. Why? Because I don't have this number in, inside the brackets. So if I run this cell, now I will not get this error anymore. Um, so again, running means running it by pressing, running a cell by pressing this button or running by pressing shift enter. Uh, for example, if I want to delete some of the cells right now, um, I can just press escape when, so, so you see when, when I click inside the cell, this border becomes green. But if, if for example, I, I, I press escape, the border becomes blue. So right now when there's a blue border, I can just press D two times and the, the cell will be deleted like, like this. So again, D two times. So the D key two times, not delete, just the D from delete. Okay, and for example, if I want to, to add cells above, let, let's put something here so you will see. Let's put Z equal one in this cell. So if I want to add a cell above this 
uh, this cell from here, I will just press escape. So you have the blue border and press the A key. So the A key will, will open a new cell just above the cell that I was, I, I was just into. So maybe I want to open a cell below this cell. So again, I press escape and followed by B and this will open a, a new cell below this one. Um, so th this, is, this is kind of Jupyter node because I said these are co code cells. Um, one important feature of Jupyter notebooks and the, the, the one that is uh, uh, very important to scientists, I, I was just reading a paper at some point, I, I, I think two or three months ago, uh, that they were saying in which they, the, the authors were saying that uh, Jupyter notebook will definitely replace, replace the research paper in papers in multiple domains. Uh, it's because you can also insert uh, markup cells. So these markup cells are actually cells with uh, text. So for example, I can add a new cell above here. So I press escape to have the blue border, press A to have the, the blue border again, but in a new cell that was added before. And I will just press the M button, which transform the cell into a markup cell. I, I can also do it from here, from cell time. I can do markdown or code. Uh, yeah, it's actually the, the language is called markdown. Um, I think you saw it on Wikipedia or if you're using confluence software, um, it, it's kind of the same markup. Um, wh what this means is, for example, I can write different things here. Uh, this will tell uh, the cell that this, this is a header of type three. So, uh, heading three kind of formatting. So let's put here a title and let's put a list. List item one, list item two, list item three. And right now when I'm running this cell because I, I can run these cells as well, they, they will be nicely formatted. So I, I can either have code cells that are explained by, by these markup cells. Um, okay. so. This is kind of Jupyter notebook. Pandas, again, this is the Excel of uh, the data scientists. So when you want to program things and you have you require a table of some sort, you, you have this pandas for it. So to use it, we will import it. This import uh, yeah, is actually how you can load modules that you already installed for Python and use them in your programs. Because when you're installing modules, they are not automatically added to your programs. So uh, to use pandas, we will use import pandas as pd. Why we are doing it like this? Because we want to import this module and not use his full, its full name, but only this shortcut, the pd. So pandas is actually, this one here needs to match the name of the module that we installed, but this, this is, some random string that we can put. So for example, if I put XT here, it, it will be the same, so it will work. But right now we will use PD because this is kind of the standard thing for pandas. So if I do this, and if I don't get an error, uh, this means that I have correctly installed pandas and uh, Python is working. Well, one, one thing, maybe, maybe the installation is not done or maybe you started Jupyter Notebook before this was installed and uh, uh, Jupyter Notebook is not aware, or at least this notebook is not aware of your uh, um, installation of Pandas, uh, then it's pretty easy. You, you can just click this kernel and restart and clear output. So when you're clicking this, it will just restart the notebook. You, you will see it clears all the numbers from within the square brackets. And right now, when I run the cell again, I will get the number one here as this notebook was reset. So to reset the notebook, again, kernel and restart and clear out. I think th this is the safest option. You can do also this, restart and run all. As I said, these pandas will provide us with uh, data frame. So why, what is a data frame? As I said, it's an Excel uh, for Python. So right now I want to create a data frame. And in order to create a data frame, I just write 
df equal pd dot data frame. And this creates an empty data frame. How do I know it's empty? I just write df in an empty cell. And if I run it, I will see that the output is just this line. This line is actually the one separating the data from the header. So for example, if I want to add columns to this data frame, it's pretty easy. Let's say I want to add um, an A column, which will contain some data, one, two, three. Um, so right now, I believe you know that this is a list. So what, what is between square brackets? It's a list in, uh, in Python. So I'm running this cell and checking again the value of the TF. I can see that I, I added the column and I have the values inside the column. So th this, is, this was pretty easy. Uh, so if I want to add a new column, TF of B, I can write a new list. This one, I will put uh, letters in it. And if I check the data frame, you can see that I, I have these uh, A and B columns with one, two, three for A and A, B, C for B. Uh, you notice that, that there's this uh, part from the beginning, which is called an index. And we, we have it in bold le letters, uh, bold numbers actually. Uh, so this index is added automatically, but for example, I, I can also extract this. So if I write df.index, you can see that this is an index that starts with zero, stops at three and with a step one. Uh, moving on, what, what can we do with this kind of data frame? So I think the, the most important thing is that we can extract parts of it. So for example, if I write df of a, I have the columns here. Uh, and what what this object is called is called a series. So you can see it has these values one, two, three, but it also has an index. This is zero, one, two. So I, I can also write dot index here, and you can see it's the same index as the as the the one above. But if I want to extract the values, I can write just values here, and I'm getting this array type. Now. You are, you are wondering why we are using this NumPy in conjunction with pandas. Yeah, because they are actually very uh, low level linked. So the data inside the data frame uh, is stored as a NumPy array. So this is actually a NumPy array from here. Okay, what other things we can do with this kind of data frame? Uh, that's pretty easy. We can, for example, select only the uh, of values uh, which are even from the column A. So for example, if I want to select only the, the part of this data frame that has only even values for A, I can write it like this. So DF of DF of A uh, percentage two. So this percentage is actually taking the modulo two operation on the numbers from, from the A, A column. So if this is equal to zero, it will do the selection. So so. As you can see, I selected only the one, the, the row that contains an even value for A. Well, it's also, you can also apply to B, but B again, this is, uh, B contains letters, characters. So I can choose, for example, the uh, only the row that contains B as A. So as you can see here, uh, I have the only the row that has uh, a B as A. Um, you notice also something in this Jupyter notebook that I could run this cell twice. So it's not a problem to run it twice. It's, it's uh, very easy. That's why we are experimenting with this a lot. Um, let, let's do some other interesting thing with, with this. For example, if I want to output this data frame from here uh, to have it, I don't know, uh, read as a CSV, that's also pretty easy to do. Um, I will write it like this, df dot to CSV, put the name of the CSV file here, my amazing data frame dot CSV. And I will add the option index equal false. Uh, what, what this means is that I don't want the index to be written to the uh, CSV file, otherwise it will be written there. So running this, as you can see, I didn't get any errors. Um, 
I can go back to the previous uh, tab for this, and you, you can see here that it created this my amazing data frame.csv. Uh, and if I open this, I can see the values in it. So I see it has the header as A and B columns, and with one, two, three, A, B, C as uh, as the values for the columns. Okay. If if I remove this index from here and run it again, I can again go back to the previous. And when I click it, you'll see that I don't have a column from here, but I have this index at the beginning. So that's that's why we are not using the uh, index when exporting to CSV. So another thing that we can do right now is actually to read this CSV into a data frame. And this is again, very easy to do. So we will just create a new data frame. I will put it data frame one like this, and I would use pd.readCSV. Again, this pd is the name of the pandas module that I gave it here. So I can use it with my amazing data frame.csv. And when I write, again, no errors. And if I look at it, I see the data frame that I recovered from the file. Um, as I was saying that this pandas, it's actually the Excel of the Python world. So uh, it also works with Excel. Remember that I asked you to, um, to install that um, uh, open XY, uh, uh, open PI Excel uh, module, and that's for reading and writing CSV, uh, Excel files. So for example, if I want to write an Excel file, it's pretty easy. Um, not that easy as the CSV, because again, we, we have this uh, Excel format, which is Microsoft one, even, even though it's, uh, open, it's open right now. Anyways, so for this one, I need to write something like this um, with, pd dot excel writer and here we give it the file name my excel file dot excel sx um yeah just this as writer i will explain what this width means don't worry um i can write like this df to excel writer uh, sheet name equal sheet one. Um, running the cell, as you can see, no errors. Uh, so width defines the context. So this context means that the writer object will be available only within width. So why are we using it like this? Is because at, at the end of the context, it will tell uh, this writer to close the connection to the file so we can open it with Excel. Otherwise, if you're just using, because this is very similar to writing it like this. So I can write it writer equal pd.excel writer my second file.xlsx um, df.2excel writer sheet name equal sheet one writer dot close. This is the equivalent of what I wrote here. So checking again, you can see the files that I created. They are the same, but I can open it from here, from uh, the Windows Explorer. So if I click it, uh, you can see I have the index here the name of the sheet that I was putting in. Okay, and the second one should be the kind of the same. You see, have the numbers, letters, everything is there. Uh, to read an Excel file, that's pretty easy as well. So going back to Jupyter Notebook, and I will define df2 equal pd dot read Excel. Put the file here, file.xlsx. Uh, and I need to specify from which sheet. Actually, if the file has only one sheet, I don't need to specify the sheet, but you, you need to get used to it. So 
I think it's it's a good thing to specify this here. So again, run it, no problem. And when I read it again, you can see that I have here the data from the file. Ah, you, you, you can see also that there's a small problem is because I, I had the, I had previously the index written to the file. Right now, when it's reading it back, I, it creates a new index and it keeps the old index as well, like this unnamed column here. Um, so again, I can pass this index equal false to, to Excel. Okay. And right now when I'm reading the file again, you can see that that disappeared. Uh, again, some, something very nice for this uh, Jupyter notebook is that I can run these experiments in, or in random orders. As you can see, I just modified here, this part, and I run again this cell and I got the result here. So I think the, this is the um, introduction, let's say, to pandas. And why do we need do we need it? Is because PyPSA is very dependent on pandas, and that's why I wanted to to present you this uh, uh, this part at the beginning. Coming back to the slides, let's look at a few equations that we will not use, but it will explain the parameters that are used in um, simulation of the power systems. Uh, so first, let's look at the voltage in an AC circuit. The voltage in an AC circuit will always be a complex number. Why? Because we need the phase information. And the phase information is uh, something that can be encoded in a complex number. How? Yeah, it's pretty easy. So uh, for example, I will draw here the complex plane. So a number in a complex plane can be represented as a uh, uh, point on the unit circle, I will do it like this. So this is the unit circle, it has the radius as one. Multiply with uh, magnitude. So in this case, let's say that we, we have this point here representing the magnitude. I will, I will, I will use the same magnitude as the voltage here. So, this, this complex number from here, so again, this is the complex number V. Uh, it, it encodes the phase as the angle between the uh, horizontal axis and, and the uh, vector that connects the origin of the coordinate system with the point uh, and the magnitude of the vector. So this, this is important in AC circuits. Why? Because um, every component that we are adding to an AC circuit will affect the phase. It, it will not affect any other parameter. It will affect the phase mostly. Uh, yeah, of course, it will affect the voltage and the current, but, but it is normal. That's happen, that happens also in a DC circuit. But in an AC circuit, this is the most uh, important part, this phase thing. So um, uh, what, what, what is the phase? Right. Um, if I am drawing here some AC current, let's say that it looks something like this. So this is the time. This is the voltage. Right. Um, when we are saying that uh, that we have a phase variance in this uh, uh, introduced by some component, this means that probably the voltage, if we are using the voltage like I'm, I'm using it here, will get delayed a little bit. This can happen by different capacitors or inductors that are connecting connected to the circuit uh, because there, there are not perfect components. We don't have only resistive loads. We have motors, we have uh, computer power supplies, we have a lot of these kind of things that introduce non-linearities to, to the system. So these non-linearities translate into phase shifts. So that's why we need complex numbers. So, so here we have the Euler notation for a complex number. We have this e to the power of j. Uh, again, this j from here, it's the square root of minus one. Okay, multiply with the uh, angular frequency and time to which we are adding the phase. So this is the frequency, this is the time, and this is the phase. 
Um, so this number here, it's actually a number of on the unit circle, uh, which we multiply with the magnitude and we obtain our complex number voltage. Uh, but uh, for example, in an AC circuit, the frequency never changes. So that's, that's one of the important laws of this system that we are analyzing right now. So this means that we can split this bracket from here and we can find the term, the first term, which is phase dependent, phase dependent, while the second term is constant. So this one will always be the same because we have the same frequency everywhere. Um, and this phase dependent uh, portion of it, we are calling it a phaser. So not, not phaser like in Star Trek phaser, but like a phase vector. That's why we have, I, I put it here. So we have the phase vector, it's a phaser. And um, during these uh, slides that I'm showing you, I, I, will always put, I will always put the tilde over these phase vectors. Okay. So now that we know what the phaser is and how we can represent the voltage in a AC circuit, moving on, let's, let's look a little bit at the Ohm's law. So you know the Ohm's law, the, the regular one, we have the voltage equals current times resistance. Uh, the problem is that uh, in AC circuits, we don't have resistance. <laughs> so yeah, we, we have it, but the general term for it, it's called impedance. So that's why you have the Z number. Uh, the current and the voltage stays the same. But again, going back to the first slide, in a DC circuit, V and Y, V and Y are uh, real numbers. Uh, while in a AC circuit, these are complex numbers. So if V and I are complex numbers, then for sure Z is a complex number as well. Um, so the Ohm's law becomes V equals IZ, which can be written in the phasor notation like this, V equals IZ, where Z is a, it's a complex number and it's called, um, it's called the impedance. Um, we will also see uh, a different notation, which is this one. Uh, v as a phasor times y equals i. Uh, and y, this one, is called admittance. Admittance. I think with double t. Yeah, and this is impedance. impedance. Ah, yeah. Okay, now that we have this clear, so the relation between a Z and Y is this one. So one over Z is Y. So if Z is measured in ohms, Y is measured in something which is called Siemens. Okay, just, just so you know. Um, as we, if we look a little bit to this equation, uh, if Z is not time dependent, uh, then this is a um, uh, time independent equation. So uh, this is what we are using for this static analysis. We are not considering that the impedances or admittances of the circuits are changing over time. Um, this is uh, not actually true. Um, they are changing over time. For example, um, an electric motor uh, gets old. So it loses some, some of its properties. So, so this impedance will modify over time or a capacitor uh, loses its ability to store charge over time because of the materials that we are using, um, things like this. So in real life, these equations are time dependent, but we can do some very nice thing that is actually doing that done also in pi PSA is to consider time moments. So for a moment in time, the equation can be static. So not time dependent. Um, so we, we can divide if, if we have a timeline like this, we can divide it into intervals for, for each interval here, 
we can consider that Z is not time dependent. Okay. Yeah, so this is why I, I think this uh, static analysis is it's important for uh, circuits and it's also it can also be generalized pretty easy to dynamic uh, to, to dy dynamic uh, processes where, where there are time dependent equations. One more thing you, you will probably ask why we are using the, this AC notation even though we I, I specifically said, somewhere at the beginning that we can use this for um, different kind of generators, including uh, these renewable ones which might produce DC power at, at uh, the output. Um, it's pretty easy because for example, for DC power, we can consider the phase as being uh, zero or uh, pi. And then this phasor becomes a real number. So uh, it, it will be uh, like a DC equation. Okay, uh, moving on. Let's see one important thing about this uh, uh, AC power systems is how we are computing power. So um, usually in a DC circuit, we, we have the power equals voltage times current. Yeah, this is the instant power. But right now we have this as complex numbers. So uh, again, we need to remember this. Uh, so, so in a um, AC circuit, we can multiply them, but we can multiply the phasors for, for it. That's why we have this equation from here. And the star here means that uh, this I with the tilde above and the star is the complex conjugate of uh, I. Usually the mathematical notation is with a bar on top. Um, so what, what does this mean? For example, if uh, I equal Let's put like this i with the tilde equal i a plus plus uh, b j, then i tilde star equal i minus b j. So when we are multiplying these numbers, so when we are multiplying two complex numbers, we are obtaining a complex number which can be written as p plus j q. Uh, and this formula from here it's called the triangle equality. Yeah, maybe because if you're putting all these parts P, Q, and uh, V, I, the product between V and I, uh, you will obtain a, a right triangle. Um, but for us, it's important that this P uh, from here, it's called the real power. Q, it's called the reactive power. And S is the apparent, apparent power. What we we are taking from here is that uh, these P and Q values are real numbers. So um, th this is important because we, in our simulation, we will mostly use this P and Q. So you you always see that these parameters will, will appear almost all the time. So P meaning the real power, it's actually the power that produces uh, uh, mechanical work. And Q is the reactive power. So it's, um, let's say some, some kind of uh, power that is wasted in the components that are connected to the AC circuit. And another important parameter that uh, uh, I will cover, and I think this is the last one for, for this AC, pa AC power um, uh, section, is the power factor, which is actually the cosine of the phase. So the cosine of the phase can be uh, computed as the real power um, against the magnitude of the apparent power. Going next, a power grid. So <laughs> because th th this is the thing that we want to simulate. Uh, and this is the thing that I want you to help to understand a little bit how, how, um, how to simulate uh, using the, this PI PSA. So um, right here, I took this picture from uh, uh, circuitglobe.com, uh, shows a power grid. A normal power grid that has uh, generating stations. Okay, that has loads, that has transmission lines, these ones. Uh, yeah, and oh, they are all interconnected. Uh, so, 
one one of the things uh, of this power grid is that we can represent it as a as a graph. So, for example, if I want to if I want to draw it, I can I can draw nodes. For example, I will draw a few nodes here that are connected with power lines. Let's say. Let's consider a complete graph. Uh, so, for example, if these connections from here are the, are the uh, transmission lines, what we will put into the nodes? Usually we'll think that, yeah, maybe in each node can be a load or it can be a generator or something else like, like, like this, something that is not connecting to cities uh, or to houses or I don't know, to locations. Um, well, actually in uh, this language of power grids, uh, the nodes are called buses. So this is a bus, each of the nodes. Uh, and these buses are places where different type of components are connecting. So um, a bus is actually one vertice of a graph, not the connection between the vertices of the graph. And to a bus, you, you can have lines connected, like you see here. So these lines are the edges. Um, you, you can have uh, transformers, for example, uh, like the ones that transform from high voltage to low voltage. And those are, again, also lines, transformer. Or you can have links from AC to DC circuits. So all these types, lines, transformers, links, are actually types of edges in, into this net in this power grid graph. And to the buses, I can connect, for example, I can connect loads. I can connect generators. Or I can connect storage units. Yes. So, so this is how we re represent a uh, power grid in, in our simulation. In what, this is the language that we are using. So we, we are using buses. So this bus is the, the uh, main uh, thing of a network. Um, I will use interchangeably the name network with graph because it's the same. So it comes from mathematics. And I will use it as grid if we, if it has buses. So a grid has buses, a network or a graph has nodes. Okay, going further. Uh, how we define these power grids in PyPSA? Yeah, that's so easy, really. So I will go to Jupyter Notebook. I click File, New, Python 3 Notebook. I just want to keep things clean. I import the PyPSA module, port PyPSA. Run it. It will take some time because it's a large module. It has a lot of components. And right now, if I want to create this kind of grid, I will just write grid equal PSA dot network, and it's creating me a grid. Uh, if you want, you, you can just check it, and you will see that this grid is of type network. Yeah, because it's the, it's the graph that is un underlying it. Um, for example, if you want to work with multiple grids, we can give it a specific name. And for that, we can just add the parameter here and just put name equal, let's say Bogdan's grid. Running the cell. And right, right now I have this output as network Bogdan's grid. So this, this is my grid. Um, I can also check various components of this grid. So for example, I will show you the a neat trick that will give you all the components that are already in the grid. So if I write dir of this grid object, I will get a list of all its properties. So you see, it has a lot of properties. Um, I can click this cell here just to get the complete list. And you can see that I have the buses, 
remember the buses are the nodes of the network. Um, and I also have a lot of carrier things, uh, generators, you can see. I have a graph of it. I have um, lines, I have links. I should have transformers somewhere. Yeah, see, or loads. Yeah, so all of them are here. So for example, right now that I know that I have access to all these components of the grid, if I want to see the grid buses, it grid dot buses. And you see that I don't have any buses. Does this look similar, very familiar to you? I should hope so, because this is very similar to the uh, pandas thing. Actually, if we check the type of this object, so if I check, to check the type, you, you can just write type of this. And you can see that the type is this data frame from pandas. So all the definitions in this PyPSA, it's actually based on Excel files. <laughs> okay, so that, that should be pretty easy to, to simulate. Um, okay, let's go back to the slides. Uh, a few of the parameters that you can use for initializing this PyPSA network are the name that we already used, um, a list of snapshots. So these snapshots are actually the time intervals that, that I was telling you about uh, before. By default, it, it's using this now interval. So this now interval means that it's this moment in time. Um, we also have snapshot weightings uh, and this simulates how long is the moment. For example, if you want uh, to have different different sizes of moments, maybe uh, one moment is, is a day, the second moment is a week, uh, the third moment is, is um, let's say a month, then you can put the weights as one, seven and 30, like 30 days in a month. Okay, then we, you have the now argument, which tells you which is the current moment in time. And this parameter from here, SRID, this is a very interesting parameter. This is a special reference system identifier. Uh, so this SRID, uh, it's, it's a number usually. And for, for, for by default, this is four, three, two, six which means that we can use uh, latitude and longitude for different buses positions. Why? Again, remember a bus is a node in the network. So for example, I can show the nodes on a map like in real life. So this SRID parameter from the network, which we will not modify and I don't recommend you to modify. It's actually, uh, representing how we will use the coordinate system to identify different buses uh, in their specific location. Okay, so let's move on. I will just uh, pass over some, uh, there's some example here with this grid. You, you, you have them in the slides. Uh, so again, we, we have these buses, which are nodes. Um, wh why we need those passes and we don't, for example, just connect the loads to the lines directly. Um, yeah, because the buses actually um, enforce conservation loads, both for charge, this means for current. So you have the laws of Kirchhoff for current and for energy, and that's the voltage. Uh, so you have the laws of uh, Kirchhoff for vo voltage are already enforced in, in these buses. Um, and so a bus has four parameters. We have the amplitude of the voltage. Right now here, we are taking the amplitude of the phaser, but the amplitude of the phaser is the same as the amplitude of the voltage when they are complex, because the, the uh, term that is uh, free has uh, amplitude one. So just to show you again what I mean here, going back here. So this one, if we're taking the modulus of it, it will be one. So that's why the amplitude of the phaser is the same with the amplitude of the voltage. 
then we have the phase angle of the voltage, which is the phase that I was just uh, describing a few minutes earlier. And we have the real power and the reactive power. So these are the components that define an AC power bus. Uh, but usually in practice, we always know at least two of them. So depending on what we know, there are three type of buses. Uh, so for example, we have generator buses. Uh, so these generator buses are buses to which we connected at least one generator. Uh, and for, for this, uh, we know the voltage magnitude and the power, the active power. We don't know the reactive power. Sorry, we know the real power. We know, don't know the reactive power. Uh, so this is unknown. And also the phase is unknown. Why? Because we are just producing uh, electric current. For example, just imagine a, a windmill that is producing current, but we don't know the phase of it compared to the network phase. Okay, this is important. It's the phase compared to the network phase, not the phase compared to itself, because the generator by default has a phase of zero. Uh, but when you try to connect it to the uh, to a grid, it will have a phase difference with the other generators in the in the network. So this is the phase difference from other generators. It can be a load bus when it doesn't have any generators to it. So then as a load, we know the real and the reactive power, but we don't know the voltage and the phase. Why? Because uh, we know the power that the uh, load requires. For example, uh, electric motor is rated for uh, some power, some uh, real and uh, reactive power but we don't know the effect of the motor when it's connected to the generator. Um, like we, we don't know how much the voltage will drop or how much the phase will shift. And then there are these slack or reference buses. Um, th these are very interesting type of bus, which, which is actually as, not, not a real bus, it's, it's actually a synthetic bus. We, we are adding it all the time. Um, it's, it's a bus that has, um, that it used to, to balance the equation, the, the laws of Kirchhoff, yeah? So that's why we have this kind of slack or reference bus. Uh, and for this one, we know the voltage and we know the phase angle, but we don't know the power the real or the reactive power. As uh, this slide explains a little bit what I explained earlier, that the generator bus has at least a generator connected to it and the uh, voltage amplitude is kept constant by controlling the reactive power. This is what we do on a generator bus. On a load bus, there are no generators connected to this bus and the uh, load bus voltage can be permitted with a tolerable value. Um, remember that for the load bus, we don't know the voltage, but for example, in the practice, uh, a network grid must, must provide a certain voltage plus minus a certain percent. I think here in Europe, we have 220 volts with plus minus 5%. So this is for the load bus. Um, so even if the voltage magnitude is unknown, we know the interval for it. And yeah, the, the phase angle for load buses is not so important. Why? Because I don't care exactly what phase I'm feeding into um, a load. It, that's really not so important. Uh, that, that's why in practice, we're mostly taking that at zero. Um, the phase is very important when we're connecting two generators to the same bus or uh, one generator from one bus connected to one generator from a different bus, because then we have these phase differences. Um, okay, and the slack, slack bus is, again, the one that, uh, that allows us to balance the equations. Uh, one, one important feature of this slack bus is that it requires at least one generator. Why? Because we will use that generator to either absorb active power or reactive power uh, from the system. No, not only absorb, inject or absorb active or reactive power from the system. Um, how we define these buses in PyPSA? That's pretty simple. Um, all the components from now on 
we will just add them with add. So going back to our Jupyter notebook, let's add a new bus. So grid dot add class name called bus. And let's put a name to it, bus number one. And if I check the buses now, I see that I have this bus already added. So as, as you can see, it has some parameters that I can set. They are the ones that I already wrote in the uh, slides. So you, you can take them from there. Uh, we have a nominal voltage. Uh, th this is in kilovolts. So one here means one kilovolt of voltage. Uh, we have a type of bus, um, but right now this is not set. Um, this is automatically set when we are connecting generators, loads, different things to the buses. So we don't need to worry about it too much. Uh, we have an X and Y positions. So these are actually longitude and latitude positions. Uh, we have a carrier. So this carrier, I think this is an important notion for the bus uh, because carriers can be almost anything. So you can put almost all strings, any string there. Uh, the predefined ones are AC and DC. So like alternative and DC, uh, alternative current and direct current. Um, but you can also use, for example, gas or coal or uh, wind or something like that. Um, because th this is the nice part for pipe PSA. It, it can use this, all, all these renewable things. So for example, if you're using uh, different carriers for the buses, you can um, simulate how different resources are converted to um, uh, electricity, let's say, or may may maybe you want to simulate how heat is distributed. So you can use as a carrier the heat. Uh, we have a unit for it. So this is the unit that we are, um, uh, the unit corresponding to the carrier. Uh, right now for us, it, it's not defined. That, that's perfectly fine. And we have some uh, voltage magnitudes uh, uh, set points. So this Vmag PU set point is the voltage magnitude. As, as you can see, it's the same as the nominal voltage from here. And this VMAG PU set is the voltage magnitude per unit set point. Uh, okay, so this PU means per unit. This means that this is actually a percentage here. So a percentage represented as a floating number. Uh, uh, so this one, it's 100%. So 100% of the nominal voltage is the set point of the voltage. Um, and we have a minimum uh, voltage magnitude at zero percent and we have a maximum voltage magnitude as infinity. So um, this means this bus can be, uh, can have any, any voltage uh, drop or increase uh, relating to the nominal voltage. For example, if I want to, to add this kind of European specific uh, uh, bus, the, the, the household bus, uh, I will add it like this. I will say grid dot add class name equal bus name household. Let's give it a number too. Uh, and we will have the nominal voltage will be zero point twenty two. So because again I I told you the unit is uh, in kilovolts. I will set the uh, PU set as one. So this means that this is the nominal voltage and this is what we are expecting that the set point is uh, 220 volts. And I will get the um, per unit minimum set point will be uh, 0 0.95 and per unit maximum set point will be 1.05. Okay, so this means a drop of 5% or an increase of 5%. Five, 5 so right now, if I look at grid.buses, you'll see that I have all these values set up. So the 0, uh, 0 0.22 kilovolts here, and I have a 1.0 uh, 
the 100% set point for the nominal voltage, and uh, I, I, I will allow a 5% drop and a 5% increase from the nominal voltage. Okay, let's go back to the slide. Um, so so th this is a bus, right? A bus doesn't have any equations attached to it. It just enforces these equations. Uh, so moving on, we need to connect these buses between them. The problem is that when we connect these buses between them, we need to follow some equations. So sorry, I have some more equations that I need to show you. Uh, okay. And right now, we, uh, in this slide, we, we have something which is called the bus admitting, admittance matrix. Again, don't be so scared about this. I'm just trying to explain you how this works and uh, to show you how we will model different things and not, not us specifically, but how this PI PCA is modeling the things. Uh, so right, right now, we, we have like uh, right here uh, representing uh, grid with three buses. We have bus one here. Uh, we have bus two here. And we have bus, bus three here. As you can see, these buses are connecting uh, between, I connecting one one with the uh, with the other with lines. So I I can consider that these are lines, like power lines. This is what I mean. And uh, I I can also consider these ones from here that are connected to the ground. So this symbol is ground. Are loads. Let's see. Okay, so I have some loads connecting between them with wires. Yeah, I know there are no generators, but but let's let's consider this. Uh, so what we need to, to compute when we have this kind of arrangement is uh, something which is called the bus admittance matrix. Um, just so you know, we, we can compute this for any number of nodes. We, we can compute it for very large nodes. And the formula is pretty simple. Uh, again, you remember what this admittance from here is. So uh, remember the formula is like this, one over Z, right? So this is what admittance compared to the impedance is. Impedance and this is admittance. That's why, why, that's why it's called admittance matrix. Um, actually it's called admittance matrix also because we, we can uh, write some kind of formula. So if let's say, I'll put M equal like this admittance matrix. Um, I, I can write off an equation which is something like this. But there's a matrix equation and Y, this Y and this V being uh, the current and the voltage for each of the buses. This, this is the nice thing. But you don't need to, to worry yourself about this too much. I'm just showing you how, how this matrix is computed. Uh, so for example, the only, the only thing that count here are the um, diagonal positions ones. So as you can see on diagonal, we, we have the sum of the admittances connecting to one of the buses. So for example, for bus one here, I have Y1, Y12, Y13. So this is the sum of them, all of the admittance is connected to this bus. So for, for the second bus, let, let's see, maybe you can uh, think of this like a matrix of buses. So, so I will have it like this uh, bus. So again, when, when I have when, when the bus on the rows is the same as the bus on the columns, I have the sum of admittances that are connected to that bus, right? Um, so the same for two here, as you can see, I have Y2 plus Y12 plus Y23, yeah, and so on. And for example, if I have a bus on a row and a different bus on a column, um, what I need to, to write here is the minus 
that mittens between the lines. If, yeah, it's one, one important thing. So for example, I can have two buses like this that are not connecting by line. So if this will disappear from here and I will stay only with Y13 and Y23, uh, then I will put zero on this position. So for example, here I have bus one and two. So I have zero on position here, zero on position here and of values here. Okay, this is how the admittance matrix is computed. Actually, it's, it's very simple. Just so you know, it, the hard part is to compute these admittances. Um, but th for these admittances, I can also use this admittance matrix algorithm to compute it. Moving on to the next slide. B based on this uh, these admittance matrices, I, I can write the, uh, equation that will balance the, active, the, the real and the reactive power. So this is what we have here. You can see not so nice equations because we, we have non-linearities in uh, at phase angle here. You can see. Uh, also this one here is uh, the, just the imaginary part. Uh, this one here is only the real part. Uh, yeah, so a lot of non-linearities. Um, that, that's why we, we need this pi PSA to solve this system of equations for us. Um, yeah, I will not go into the details of how this equation look like, uh, but, but just so you know, this pi PSA solves all this equation for, for us. We just need to define the model, just put the loads, the generators, transformers, lines, anything there. And after that, pi PSA will take care of solving the uh, Every, everything for us. Moving on, so lines. Lines are transmission and distribution lines. Uh, so these are edges in the graph that I showed you. Um, who, why I put it here? So I, I put in the slides the line model. So how the Pi PSA is considering a line transmission model. So, so as you can see, uh, a line connects between two buses. So we have a bus zero here and a bus one into this other end. And right, uh, bus, sorry, bus one, I meant. So now the admittance matrix look, looks quite similar. We, we have these two nodes here. And as you can see, we have one over Z plus Y over two. Remember that if I write this in, as an admittance, it will be one over Z. That's why we have one over Z plus one uh, Y over two. Again, we have minus one over Z and minus one over Z here because this is what connects these two points, the Z uh, impedance. And on this other end, we have one over Z plus Y over two again. Um, that's why I wanted to show you this admittance matrix, just, just so you understand a little bit why, from where all these formulas are coming from and how easier are to use them. But again, we will not do the operations. Pi PSA is doing it for us. But just so you know how this line model looks like. Um, this here, it's called shunt. Why? Because it's put in parallel with the, uh, the bus connection. And this from here is called the series. So we have a series impedance and a shunt admittance, okay? Just so you know, for for um, for the name of the parameters. So moving on, lines in Pi PSA. What arguments do they have? They have a name, of course. They have two buses. So we have the bus zero and a bus one to which the line uh, which the line connects to. Uh, we have a type, and this this time this type is important. For example, um, if you don't know exactly how a line is defined. Uh, if you are not the builder of it, there are tables that show you uh, all these properties. And for this Pi PSA, it's pretty smart because you can specify different standard names like this one. And you will say, where, where did you get this from? It's very easy from this link from here. And it will set all the values to the uh, correct uh, values. Otherwise, in our models, for example, uh, we, we can use 
um, this for these these parameters from here, we which we have the uh, series reactance, series resistance, shunt. Uh, the real part of the shunt admittance and uh, uh, the imaginary part, part of the shunt admittance. You see here, uh, th these are the uh, equation that I wrote. And just so you know where these values are coming from. So this Z from here is the one that I showed you here. So this, uh, maybe not put an equal here, you put an equal here. So this Z equals uh, R plus JX. And here, this one equals one over two J plus, plus JB. Okay. So this is where, where the parameters are coming from. Uh, but again, you can specify the line type and the line type ha has all these parameters already computed. And if you specify the line type, it's important to specify the length. Uh, length, because all the parameters are by unit of length. So if you're using a type, specify the length. Otherwise, these uh, XRGB parameters from here are the ones that, um, uh, that, that are uh, available for the whole uh, line. So. Let's, let's see how we connect our two buses with the line. Not, not a very smart idea to uh, connect these two buses because we have a very large difference of voltage between them, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. We, we can write it. Uh, so grid.add class name equal line. It's important how we are writing this with capital letters. So again, name equal, um, let's say line one. And uh, as I said, for, for these lines, we need to specify um, specifically these parameters, the, the XRGB parameters. And one important thing is that this X, X and R cannot be zero. So we'll put, X equals 0 0.01 and R equals 0 0.1, let's say. I think we're pretty good with this. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, got this error. Yeah, forgot to connect it to the buses. So bus zero is uh, bus number number one and bus one equal household number two. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So as you can see here, I got another error, which tells me that the object that I want to add already exists. This is what, because I tried to add it again. So let's let's check the grid dot lines. As you can see, I have the line one added here um, and I don't want that, I want to remove it. So if I want to remove some object from a grid, I just use the remove plus name equal line and I need to specify the name, name equal line number one. And right now I removed and let's reconnect the line. And if I check the grid dot lines, right now I have this line connected to both these buses. Okay, so this is how I, I, I define lines. Okay, moving on. So now that we define the lines, Let's see, we, some, sometimes we need the transformers or at least in our example there, we need these transformers. Transformers are very similar to lines. Uh, for example, if we take a look at, at their model, you will see that it, it looks like a line. So this part here 
it's actually the same line model, right? If we check, uh, yeah, this one, see, very, very similar to the line model. Uh, the only difference between them and the lines is that we have this converter of voltages, um, which, which has a, a transforming ratio, like a, we, we, the name being tap ratio. So this N from here, it's called the tap, tap ratio for, for the transformer. Uh, this model of transformer is called the pi model. Why? Because it looks like a pi number. There is also a T model, which will split the Z into two and have only one shunt admittance. And this is the T model. Um, to convert from T to Pi, it's pretty easy because you split this Z into two Zs. So you have Z over two and Z over two, and this will become Y here. So the admittance, matrix will be a little different because we have only one node here and we can just add everything to this node. That's pretty simple. We, we don't have this complex thing as, as we have it like here. Um, okay, so the, this is a transformer model. Um, I will not, I will try to skip this, uh, uh, modeling part and just go to directly to the to how we can add the transformers to uh, the pi PSA uh, we just use the class name transformer that's it and we need to provide the name we need to provide two buses that's important we also have types so again as for, as for lines if you don't know the parameters of a transformer you can just go and look at the list from here. And just hit enter to have it blue. So if I click this link, I will get a list of transformers which are already available for me with all the parameters considered. And we can also set some uh, parameters here like X and R, like for transmission lines, G and B exactly for transmission lines. We have a top ratio, which is the ratio of per unit voltages at, at each pass. So I can divide the, uh, for example, in my case, the tap ratio will be, let's see, uh, which one it can be 1000 volts divided by 20, 220. So that's 4.54. So for me, this will be 4.54. Uh, I also can specify the tap side. So which of the buses uh, uh, is, is the largest one. <laughs> so in my case, it, it will be bus zero, I guess. Uh, let's, let's check the Pi PSA uh, notebook. So let's see, bus zero is the bus with the higher voltage. So yeah, it will be zero. So we'll let left the default one. And we have a phase shift. Uh, so this is the phase shift angle that can be computed via the admittance matrix. Um, or we can use a predefined uh, transformer and that, that will be predefined. Uh, so let's add, a, uh, let's remove the line from here and let's add the transformer instead of it. So let's do the same grid remove class name equal, uh, let, let me move this from in front of me. So line name equals line one. Grid add class name transformer name one. Uh, okay, we will have a bus zero equal bus number one. A bus one equal house old number two. Have top ratio equal for 54. And I guess this is it. Uh, ah, let's put an X 
and R as we put it before. And when I check grid transforms, I can see here that I have a, a transformer with the parameters that I already set. Somewhere in the middle of this should be the tab column. So how can I do that? Remember that this is a pandas data frame, so I can use uh, tab ratio. And you can see here that for transformer number one, I have the tab, tab ratio is 454. Cool, right? So I added transformers. Moving on, what what are the components? I think we <laughs> we we need to go to. I, I will just quickly, but not show you how you we we can add its links. So these links can be added between two different uh, carriers. So it can either be from uh, uh, between an AC and a DC bus, or I I don't know different these kind of carriers. And the important parameters of them are the efficiency of converting that carrier to uh, um, uh, from converting the uh, energy from one carrier to the energy of another carrier. And we have two powers, uh, actually one power and two power limits, one minimum and one maximum one. Um, re remember that the power is always expressed in megawatts, okay? So that, that's important. Uh, moving on, I was, I was talking about generators. Let, let's, let's see. So generators are the ones that are um, generating the, the current for us. So right, right now we don't have any generators connected to our grid. Uh, our grid is pretty simple. No generators, no loads. We have only the lines. So we had the two nodes and um, one line between them. So generators, uh, one, one important thing is they attach to a single bus. So you cannot have a generator connected to multiple buses. For example, if you want to connect one generator to multiple buses, how will, will you do it? Because this is actually something that can be done in practice. For example, you have um, one generator that needs to provide power for two households uh, in two different cities. Um, so to do that, for example, you take your generator, I will just put a G, connect it to the first bus. This is a unique bus, but for example, you can split afterwards with two transmission lines or transformers, I don't know, or links, and you can go to bus two and bus three. So this way, yeah, you cannot connect your generator to two buses at the same time, but you can connect it to one bus and to split it into two other buses. Uh, yeah, this is a trick to overcome this single bus. Um, another thing is that it converts energy from its carrier to the carrier type of the bus to which it's attached. So for example, yeah, generators have carriers as well. You can have wind, I don't know, uh, coal, uh, nuclear energy, whatever, things like this. And they will convert it to the carrier type of the bus. So for example, if I connect the generator to my main bus, it will be converted to the AC power. Um, yeah, one, one important thing about the generators is that they can be conventional. So these conventional generators are the ones that you can um, adjust. I, I think this is a cool thing. For example, you can give them more power or give them less power. Um, it's, it depends on the amount of uh, carrier that you're putting into the generator and you can easily control this. For nuclear reactors, you can do that. For coal uh, power plants, you can do that. For hydro, you can do that. Uh, for gas, you can do that. But for example, you have also environment dependent generators. So these environment dependent generators are like solar panels and windmills and um, some, some of these renewable uh, generators. And these are providing power within the limits uh, set by time series. Why? Because, for example, you don't have sun during the night. That's that's simple. And during the night, it will not produce any power. So you cannot, for example, just uh, you, you, during the day, you can cover the solar panels with something and they will not produce any uh, any power. But but during the night, you, you I don't think it's efficient to uh, light up a light bulb and put it in front of the uh, solar panels. 
Um, so how can we simulate this kind of uh, generator? So that's pretty easy. Um, as you can see here, I will skip the name, bus, uh, and carrier types. Uh, I will come back to this control part. Uh, but again, we, for, for example, this control can be set, but it will be set automatically uh, by the algorithm for you. So you need, don't need to worry so much about it. Uh, I think the, the important are parameters are the uh, expandable nominal power. So if this is true, it means that you can expand the power um, with some cost. One, one interesting thing about this PI PSA is, all, is that it also computes the costs. So for example, you can specify what is the cost of expanding the power with one megawatt, and that will be taken into consideration when the cost simulation is done. Uh, you have a nominal power with two limits, uh, one minimum and one maximum one. Uh, so these minimum and maximum ones are, are taken into consideration only if the power is expandable, otherwise it's not. Um, then you can also have a minimum per unit power and maximum per unit power. So again, this is a percentage. Remember, like, like I show you, every time you see this PU here, this is a percent. Okay, but it's a percent like in the normal mathematical way with one being 100% and zero being 0%. Um, so as, as you see here, I can specify this as series. What, what is this series? Uh, it's, it's a column in pandas. So I can load, for example, if I uh, go, um, I, have I have sensors deployed on the field. Yeah, I will have the power um, delivered by some, I don't know, uh, generator like a solar panel recorded in this Excel file. And I can use this Excel file directly and feed it into PyPSA via this column here. Also the maximum, so this is the minimum power per unit, and this is the maximum power per unit. And I can specify this as series. So I take them from Excel files or CSV files and just fit them here. And then I can do the simulation with real data. Um, also the P set and Q set are the uh, real power and the reactive power set points. So the ones that I wish to, um, th this is what the set point is, is the, the point that I wish to obtain. Um, I, can also I, I can also specify the marginal cost. So this marginal cost, it's actually the cost per megawatt. So I can do very nice computation and simulation about how much it will cost to, to produce some power. Uh, then I have capital cost. So again, if if the capacity is expandable, this is the cost per megawatt expanded. So if I if my generator is producing two megawatts at first, uh, I can expand it by paying this. Also, these generator models that are used in PyPSA also have reserves. So reserves are storage units that can store energy and can dispatch it. So the efficiency to store store energy is this parameter from here and the efficiency to dispatch the energy is this one. And these are per unit as well. So as well as percentages represented from the nominal power. Um, one important thing here, if you don't have this storage unit, you can just set them to zero and everything will be fine because the generator will not store anything. Just remove them. That's two. Um, maybe add them here. Zero. No storage. Yeah, you will say, but how can I specify? Uh, do, do we have storage models also? Yeah, there are storage models. So this PyPSA also have storage. It has almost every component that you can imagine. We are we are close to the end, so bear with me a little bit more. I wanted to to do something, some some more explanation, but I, I can see that it takes me too much time to cover everything. So so 
switching to Jupyter Notebook to, to add the generator here. So we can just greet dot add class name equal generator. And we will add uh, this generator with the name gen1. And it will be connected to the bus bus number one. So it's the high voltage bus for us. Um, and we have here the, we'll specify the nominal power, uh, which will be like, we have a very small generator, okay? Grid generators to see what we have, what we've added. Okay, so if I added the generator, then I think the, the last part that we need to add here is the loads. So again, loads like generators can be attached to a single bus. Actually, I, I, again, you can do this. You can uh, attach loads to multiple buses by using the same trick. So you can use uh, bus one is the one that has the load connected. And then you can split this in bus number two and bus number three. Uh, so, so for example, maybe you have you want a redundant uh, grid that provides uh, power from two different sources to the same load. So this can be done using this. And the load has very few parameters, as you can imagine. It 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 has a uh, uh, real power and um, reactive power set points, and uh, these are this can be also series. So why would you like series here? Yeah, maybe we want to um, simulate how the network um, behaves when you have a consumer that works during the day and goes to work. So uh, the power consumption will, will decrease. And when he, he or she returns from work, uh, the power consumption increases for a small period of time. On, maybe during the night, again, we have a very uh, low power consumption. Um, yeah, so we can simulate this by using data from the sensors, just upload it directly via the CSV. Um, yeah, and I, I guess this is it. Ah, another important part is this sign thing. So the sign specifies if the load is a generator or, or a consumer. Um, I didn't put the parameter in the table, but, but there is this kind of sign also for generators. So loads and generators can be used inter interchangeably. Uh, but again, it's better to use a generator as a generator and the load as a load, not the other way around. Um, so um, let's connect our load to, to, to the bus. So let's see, we have, uh, oh, sorry, just clicking the cell, grid add class name equal load, name equal, I press Y just to convert it back to a uh, uh, code type. Uh, name ID load one, bus will be household, uh, and I'll put the set equal, I don't know, let's put some number here. Uh, let's put 95, Q set equal zero point five. Uh, I'm, I'm just adding these numbers to be a little less than this one. So. Right now that I added the load generator, the transformer between the two buses, I can run the simulation for, for this grid. So I can run write it like this grid.pf. And this, this is how I'm uh, checking how the model is running. Um, here I can put a parameter, which is the moment for which I want to run the simulation. But for me, I have only one moment, this is now. So um, I will just run it like this. And you can see that my model right now didn't converge. 
So I, I have some problem with my transformer here. Most probably um, some of the parameters didn't work correctly. But uh, let's let's build a, a model that actually runs. So I will just copy paste here the code for a grid that is uh, actually running. And as you can see, I added uh, three buses. So these are the three buses with 20 kilovolts lines. I added the lines between the buses with uh, resistance of 0 0.01 and uh, reactance of 0 0.1. And I added a generator with uh, 100 megawatts power to it and a load with one 100 megawatts and uh, 100 megawatts for uh, uh, reactive powers. So if I run this, this simulation, uh, the, the, let's put the grid okay here. So this is the grid, it's okay. I can see that right now the network converged and it took three iterations for it to get solved. So checking the P values, grid okay, dot lines P. I can see here, for example, the power that is absorbed by each of the lines from the bus zero and the reactive power that is, that is absorbed by each of the lines from, from bus zero and the same for bus one for each of the lines. And I, for example, can check the loads and I can see here the power that was consumed by the loads. I can also check the generators to see how much power I, I, it required. As you can see, it, it increased a little bit from the power, that, the power set point that I set, uh, but this is normal because I, I requested more reactive power from it via the load. Okay, so I hope you find this small lecture interesting. I think, yeah, we don't have enough time to cover everything. I had to keep this under one and a half hours and I think I, I already gone over a little bit, but you can check the documentation if you're curious about this PyPSA and uh, run the examples yourself. And as you can see, it's not hard to, to do simulation for complex networks uh, using this kind of uh, tools. So thank you. And I hope to see you in Romania soon. Bye-bye.